So today's scripture reading is from Mark, chapters 10, verses 13 to 16, and it reads as follows. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Don't stop them, because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. After taking them in his arms, he laid his hands on them and blessed them. This is the word of the Lord. I want to ask you two questions. Listen up. How dependent are you on God? Second question, how confident are you in his love for you? How dependent are you on God? How confident are you in his love for you? Let's think about our kids for a minute. Well, firstly, we were all kids at some point, right? So you don't have to have kids to understand this. Everyone can relate. Some of us do have kids, though. Uh, those were the ones who chuckled really loud now with question of the day. Some of you might have had kids, but they're all grown up now. As I thought about our kids this week, I was reminded of a phase in the life of our kids where you heard the following words all the time. Papa, ja bok, sal papa asseblief, kan ek asseblief, will you please, can I please? And once you've answered that, a few minutes pass, papa, ja bok, same thing all the time. It's our kids' role. Kids are dependent, and they know it, and they're not ashamed to say it. It's the amazing thing about kids. It's like, why on earth would I be ashamed of the fact that I need my mom or dad to do literally everything? As I thought about kids this week, I was reminded of how kids enter a conversation. So we used to live quite close to my parents when my brother was also not married at that point, so he still lived with them. So whenever any of them would come through the door, you would see the kids go, Opa! Worm <coughs> Adi! <coughs> And they would just run. Like, they work from the assumption that these people are excited to see us. <laughs> because we're awesome. <laughs> That's how kids roll. Have you ever seen a kid crashing a conversation? Really deep conversation. Kid goes, all of you would like to hear what I'm about to say. <laughs> so I'm just going to say it. Confidence that they are loved. Our previous house, our bathroom in our uh, room had a sliding door. Parent goes to bathroom, kids follows parent and goes, <laughs> right in there. No privacy. It's our kids' role. If you ask a kid to be cute, they're cute. They don't have any fear. Because they're pretty sure that my cuteness is going to be appreciated by all of these folk. Kids say I'm loved, and I know it. So I don't need to have any fear. In our teaching text today, Jesus says you have to be like a kid if you want to enter the kingdom. Look at it again with me, verse 15. Truly I tell you, Jesus says, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. So, are you like a kid? I asked you earlier, how dependent are you on God? Do you live a life where you go, Papa, can I please? Papa, will you please? Papa, can I please? Papa, will you please? Do you live that kind of life? Is that how dependent you are on God? I asked you earlier, how confident are you in His love for you? Do you know that you're loved? If I look at your life, am I able to say this person lives a life 
loved by God, and they know it. And they don't have any fear. Can I remind you, last week Jesus dropped some big ones. Do you guys remember what it was? I'm going to die, you must die, I will live, you will live. And I showed you that the characters in the story, as Jesus drops these heavy truths, they are often left with question marks. Let me show you the slides. I zoomed in a little bit because Marie said, listen, dude, I know your eyes are all good, but mine are not. So, hey, I've got a zoomed in picture. First conversation, Mark chapter 8. Jesus has a conversation with his disciples. Jesus says what it means for him to be the Messiah. Question mark, question mark, question mark. People are grappling with what it means. Second conversation comes in Mark chapter 9. If I can have the next slide, please, Rudolf. And there you see again, Jesus says what it means. He announces his death, and they are left with question marks. Third conversation, this is where Shiami will be in two weeks' time. Jesus announces his death again. He brings this whole section to a climax, and once again, people are left with question marks. What? How can it be? It sounds so upside down. How can we win by losing? And now what Jesus is doing is he's using this as a teaching moment, trying to help people listen closely to get past their resistance to his announcement of his death. And he's calling them to do the same. Do you guys see it? So that's where the question marks come from. Why do you have to die and why do we have to die? And now Jesus is using this moment to say, let me help you get past that resistance. Now one of the ways in which you can get past it is to be like a kid. And that's our theme for today. Receiving the kingdom like a kid. Three points. Here we go. How do we receive the kingdom like a kid? We need, we come, and we receive. We need we come and we receive. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for being compassionate to us. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for helping us get past our own resistance. Thank you for repeating again and again to the disciples and to all your followers and to anyone who would listen that you are going to win by losing and that the same counts for us. Thank you for this beautiful portion of Scripture. We are looking forward to learning something from you today. So illuminate our hearts, open up our eyes, give us great focus as we work with your word. We pray that in your name. Amen. I want to show you our triangle just before we launch out. Do you guys remember that we said a disciple knows God through encountering him? Do you guys remember that? So we say a disciple knows God, a disciple commits faithfully, and a disciple gives generously. We say this is how we love God and how we love people. And then when we talk about knows God, commits faithfully, and gives generously, we also have a how. And how we know God is through His Word, through encountering Him, and through worship. Now I want you to know today's sermon sits in the top corner. This is all about an encounter with Jesus. And through this encounter, knowing Him better. Are you guys with me? Okay, last one. This is Fellowship City's discipleship journey. If you have never seen it, we actually have a link where you can download it and where you can study it. You can chat to me after the service. So Mark 10 from verse 13, which is where the teaching text starts, all the way through to 31, consists of three units. Okay, The first one is our teaching text for today. That's the reception and the blessing of the children. The second one is where we'll get next week, and that's the dialogue with the rich man, or we know him as the rich young ruler. And then after that, I'll also cover that next week, is where D Jesus teaches on the danger of money. Now, what links these three units together, the theme for these three units are entry into the kingdom. The question, how do I get in? Now, Jesus looks at children and says, children will gladly... And without conditions, take the opportunity. You guys know that's what kids are like. Say, hey kids, gather around. And then they just all come. Because there's something good that's going to happen there now. If we are caught up in the cares of this world, we'll often hesitate to commit. We'll often have to think things through first. Have you guys ever seen when you play a game with kids and you go, okay, I need a volunteer. All the kids go, pick me, pick me, pick me. Why? Because they are fully present. Kids have a way 
of being fully present here and now. There's nothing more important to them than the current moment. We live in an age of weapons of mass distraction. I didn't say destruction. I said distraction. And because we live in an age of weapons of mass distractions, I need to ask you this question. How present are you? Here and now. Kids, if they get a whiff of something good, they want it. We saw this uh, on the playground just a week ago. So it was after school. We were at the school ground. Some of the kids were waiting to play netball, and some of the kids were done with netball. And what one of the parents did is she bought a bag of ICs. What is an IC? An IC. A, 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 a what? A frozen lolly. An ice lolly. She bought a bag of ice lollies. And she literally took the bag of ice lollies and gave it to the first kid. A minute. Woof. All the kids are around her. Why? Woo, because there's something good there. We don't want to miss out on that. Kids have a way of seeing something that's good and then they go for it. Jesus says, and he's actually been quite shocking here, that you should follow their example. Now remember, in the time of Jesus, the future of kids were very uncertain. There was a high mortality rate among infants and young children. Children weren't really valued in the world that Jesus lived. But Jesus says that they are the first to see the kingdom and to go for it. And that's why you have to be like them. Now, it's supposed to be jolting to us. It's supposed to be jarring to us. So let's work through the text with this frame I just mentioned, and then look at the three points. Okay, so we need, we come, and we receive. Let's look at verse 13. It'll be up on the screen. So people were bringing, and they were bringing for a reason, that he might touch, and then something happened. So we aren't told in the text who exactly is bringing the, chil the children to Jesus. We presume that it was their parents. And they brought them because they were hoping for some form of benefit or some form of blessing. Obviously, in late antiquity or in the time that Jesus lived, it was believed that by touching a holy man, even just touching his clothing, or being touched by him would bring blessing or would bring healing. Think of the lady who chased after Jesus in Mark chapter 5 that we passed over a few weeks ago. She just wanted to touch his robe. And when she did, she got healed. So there is actually a case to be made for why people believe that. Now, Mark doesn't say who the disciples rebuked. Did they rebuke the children or did they rebuke the parents? Nor does he give any reason why they rebuked them. It's crazy, huh? So it's like, the disciples rebuked them. Do you mind telling us who and why? Like, what was the big problem with the children coming to Jesus? So I think if you read Mark or Mark's intended readers, people who lived in the first century, they probably assumed that the children would have been seen as disruptive and that the children would have been seen as a distraction. It's possible for them to make the mistake to think that Jesus had more important things to do. And Jesus had more important people to meet. Or that Jesus maybe didn't have time for children. Well, that's what they thought. Here's the thing. The children wanted God's blessing. They wanted Jesus' blessing. And their parents also wanted it for them. So if you think of our first point, we need, let me ask you this question. Do you need God's blessing? Or are you quite okay without it? Nah, I'm good, thanks. Sorted. Week looks nice. I've got money in the bank. I've got a house. Everything on my side is kind of sorted. I don't feel this deep desire to be blessed by you. We often think that lack or deficit or scarcity or poverty and need go together. So that means that when we talk about abundance or when we talk about sufficiency, like we have enough, or when we think about our ability to end scarcity, right? So I am scarce on food. I want to eat. I can go and buy food and then eat so I can end the scarcity. We often don't think of need in that context. 
That's why I slipped in the word desire. Because if I ask you, do you need God's blessing? You'll probably answer me with, well, I have it already. But if I ask you the question, do you desire God's blessing? That's something different. Because you ought to desire God's blessing regardless of where you think you are in life and regardless of how self-sufficient you think you actually are. So let me ask that to you again. What do you desire? Do you desire to know God and to experience His blessing? Only you will be able to answer that question. I can't answer that question for you. And you can even answer that question to me with your lips and you can lie. Because that's something that starts in the heart. I really, really need you. I earnestly seek you. I want you passionately. Have you ever seen a kid that's lost? They don't care about anything else than finding their parent. Because that is what I truly, truly desire. Like everything was fine until I realized that my parent is gone. I want them now. And they'll cry and shout and scream until they find them. Why? Because they know that they lost without them. Papa, if there's no your book, there's no life. Do you guys see the parallel? How dependent, uh, yeah, how dependent are you on God? If you are, your life will be marked by, Papa, will you please? Papa, can I please? More often than not. Here's my hunch. We depend on our money more than we do on God. We depend on our family more than we do on God. We depend on our skills and our qualifications and our opportunities more than God. Papa, will you please, oh no, actually, I don't need you to do that for me because I've got all of these great resources that can do that for me. I can throw money at that problem. I can ask someone to help me. Ooh, I actually have the skill to get myself out of this mess. So God, ta, I don't need you now. We often make that mistake. Why? Because we feel like dependence is weak. Now, I have news for you. If you think that dependence is weak, this text says dependence is the way of the kingdom. So make your choice. Do you want to be in or out? Because if you think that dependence is weak, you won't enter the kingdom. If you actually believe that it is the way of the kingdom and you humble yourself and you choose for that dependence, you're in. You need to need if you want to be like a kid and enter the kingdom of God. You need to need. And you need to believe that there's abundance that God offers and it's given to us and we invited into it and you need to be present to see it. If you receive this invitation today as God's saying to you, come and enter the kingdom and the way to do it is to be like a kid, and you say, no, thank you, I'm good, thank you very much, you will not enter the kingdom of God. We need. That's how we receive the kingdom. Like a kid. Are you with me? Okay. We need, first point. Second point, let me put it on there for you. We come. Look at the highlights with me. We'll be in verse 14. Jesus saw it, and he was indignant. Did anyone use the word indignant this week in a WhatsApp or in an email? Okay, so we'll spend some time there. Let the little children come. Don't stop them, because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Okay, verse 14. Jesus is indignant over his disciples' behavior. Uh, the best way probably to translate indignant in South African vernacular is, no, guys, no. Afrikaans, ach, nee, man, nee. 
That's indignant. So the disciples rebuke, and Jesus goes, guys, 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 no, 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 no. So Jesus is being indignant here. Actually, a little bit later, the disciples will be indignant when James and John request the prime seats of new government, uh, government. All the disciples will be indignant when there's a woman who anoints Jesus' head with expensive perfume. There's a little struggle going on in the group of disciples and between Jesus at the moment. Why? Because the way that Jesus is teaching them, he will be the Messiah. They do not want to accept it. So there's a lot of tension and struggle and strife at the moment. Now remember, the question uh, in this portion of Scripture is, who can enter? And who can enter? And the way that that question is answered is based on the question, what does it mean for Jesus to be the Messiah? So everyone is arguing because they want to know who is right. It's kind of an intense episode going on here. Now, Jesus explains why, thank you for that, Jesus, the disciples should not forbid children to come to him. And the key word is not little children. The key word is belongs. Do you guys see that? The kingdom of God belongs to people such as these. They have every right to approach Jesus and to be blessed by him. Whoa. Who does it belong to? To kids or to people like kids? The answer is yes. <laughs> both. And both of those truths are quite jarring. So the kingdom of God belongs to children. They have every right to come. They are valued highly. And the kingdom of God belongs to people. Woo! Luckily, we qualify like kids. So you be like them. Can you guys imagine if I would go home after this service, and I would rock up at my house, and someone would rebuke me and tell me, you can't go in there. I'll go, dude, it's my house. Well, it's not my house, we're renting it, but you know what I mean? Like, I've got the keys, man. I'm allowed in here. Why on earth would you rebuke me? That's exactly the point that Jesus is making to his disciples who are rebuking the kids. Now, kids matter, yes, praise God for them. That's a whole different sermon, though. I think many of you have heard this teaching text preached under that theme. Kids matter to Jesus. And they do. Yes and amen. I'm just not preaching on that from this text this morning. We need children to teach us something. Do you guys remember that I asked you earlier, how confident are you in his love for you? Do you guys remember that I said, have you studied how kids barge into a room? Let me ask you this question. Have you seen how kids rightfully take what is theirs? Hey? Okay, Dalmas, come here quickly. Dalmas is ladies in Afrikaans. All right, so I've got one for you, Avis, and one for you, and it's snatched. Done. Gone. You said that one is mine. Taking it. Right there. No need to wait. It is mine. It's how kids roll. Thanks. Take care. I'm off. They didn't even, they're not even interested in, in why or how or who else. It's like, you said this is mine, I shall take it now. Tim Keller has this beautiful quote that's been used a gazillion times all across the globe. But let me say it to you again. He says, is it on the screen, Rudolf? Did I put that one on the slide? No. Tim Keller says, the only person who dares wake up a king at 3 a.m. for a glass of water is a child. And then he says, we have that kind of access. Do you want to receive the kingdom? Then come. No fear. Because there's no chance of rejection. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? If you do, let me ask you a few more questions. Do you ever... Do you ever come? Or are you one of those Christians that wait for God to come to you? Do 
Are you intentional about coming to God? Are you seeking Him? Because that's how you receive the kingdom. Do you hide when you sin? Just by the way, kids actually do that too. But that's a characteristic that we shouldn't strive to have. When kids sin, they hide. But here's the crazy thing. After you've had the conversation with them, and you tell a kid that they're forgiven, they are back into it like this. So easy! And so soon! It's like there was Armageddon in our house. Tears and snot, and it was a dog show. And then you say, I love you deeply, and they go, awesome! Hey, do you want to go and do a cartwheel outside? They really move past it quickly. Because why would a kid doubt what you told them? You see, that's the key. Is I bend down to our kids and I go, Papa really loves you. And they go, awesome! Yeah! I don't have to doubt that, because he's my dad. I know that he won't lie to me. So I believe it, just like that. You know that the same happens to us, right? So when we do sin, and when we do repent, and when you do experience the Holy Spirit convicting you once again of God's amazing love and affirming His love for you, you should go, awesome, and then get going again. Because you're forgiven. Like there's nothing to pay. There's nothing left to do. That's how we receive the kingdom like a kid. First one, we need. Second one, we come. Third one, we receive. So let's look at verses 15 and 16. Truly I tell you, it says, that's the way that Jesus says, headline news, stop, listen, write this down, tweet this, post this, big announcement. Are you guys with me? Okay, so what he's about to say isn't just a by the way remark. Okay, and then he says, does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child, will never enter it. Whew. Okay, that's a heavy one. We'll look at it now. And then we see this beautiful, compassionate, loving description of Jesus doing two things. He takes them in his arms, actually three things. He puts his hands on them and he blesses them. Okay, so let's look at them. Let's look at verse 15 first. Jesus makes the point that you should accept the kingdom and be obedient to its commands in the same way that children, without question, obey adults and do what they are told. Okay? So all of you that are parents just went, whoa, 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 whoa. My kids don't just obey. They don't just always do what they're told. Fam, I know. But do you remember when they were really small? <laughs> when they were really small? <laughs> They used to be really obedient. Jesus is talking about that age, okay? He's talking about that age. And he says that we have to accept the kingdom and be obedient to it in the same way. So to receive the kingdom of God is to submit to the authority of God's rule. Here's the issue with submitting to the authority of God's rule. The issue is you also have some authority as an adult. You also have some perception of power that you possess. And your power and your authority will clash against the power and the authority of Jesus. You can't have two masters. And that's why Jesus says, if you want to enter, you have to submit under my authority. I call the shots. If you want to call the shots, we are going to clash with each other the whole time. So I know that you're all powerful and all important and you've got a lot of authority. Fair play. Not in our relationship. It's not how it works. Have you ever thought about that? You can't speak to God like a CEO. Can't do it. You can't speak to God like a teacher. You can't speak to God like a managing director. You can't speak to God like a whatever it is that you do every single day. You can't do it. You are his child. Not half-half. 100% in as his child. So the person who wishes to receive the kingdom 
must receive it as a child does, without presumptions of self-importance and self-empowerment. Kids don't live with that burden. They don't feel like everyone should deem them to be important. Kids don't want to be independent and empowered. They're cool to just roll with you. Because you anyway, much bigger than I am and much older than I am. And you know much better. So what are we doing next? That's how kids cruise. And when it comes to the kingdom, we should do the same. Without calculation and without giving restricted access to certain areas of our lives. See, that's the problem, fam. Usually, the Spirit convicts us of sin, saying, all of your life is mine, and you need to submit all of your life to me. And then instead of being kids and going, okay, we think we're clever. So we calculate. We think, how much can I give? How much should I keep? Should I not maybe just keep on calling the shots in this space? I know that the Spirit is telling me to do this in my workplace, but I think that's actually an unwise decision. I shouldn't. I feel like the Spirit is leading me to give this or to sacrifice this, but I actually had other plans for it, so I'll get back to that later. That's the problem with being an adult. See, for a kid, you go, do you want the AC? Yes, please. AC, done. Have you ever seen a kid go, ooh, actually, Dad, we haven't had our lunch yet, so we will have our ice lolly after lunch. Like, I've thought about this. I've calculated it in my head. That's not what kids do. Because they trust our leading in that sense. That's what it means to be like a kid and to receive like a kid. Are you guys with me? Okay, I'm about to land the plane. Let's look at verse 16. Taking them in his arms. Do you guys see that Jesus does not merely touch the children? He does more than that. He takes them into his arms. He hugs them. He holds them. Verse 13 says that the parents brought their kids to be what by Jesus? Not hugged by him, just to be touched. Like, just touch my kid and we're good. But Jesus hugs them. Mark 9, 36 says exactly the same. It's a public demonstration of children's acceptance and value in the kingdom. And then, as Jesus is hugging these children, I mean, it's a vivid moment now, isn't it? How beautiful. This super important, super clever, super holy, super successful, super awesome rabbi hugging dirty kids that didn't brush their teeth this morning. Hey? Eh? And then Jesus goes, ooh, this is a good teaching moment. Let me use this moment of embrace and teach people exactly how I actually relate to them. Why am I making much of the hug? Because in the parallel passages in Matthew and in Luke telling the same story, it doesn't say that Jesus hugged them. We only read in Mark only twice that Jesus hugs people and we read that he hugs who? He hugs children. It's an exceptional and an important display of compassion and of the love of Jesus. And as he hugs them, he lays his hands on them. Elsewhere in the gospel, we see Jesus laying hands on people, right? I mentioned Mark 5, 23, a little bit earlier, uh, when Jesus, well, when Jairus or Jairus asked Jesus to lay hands on his daughter. We read in Mark chapter 6 that Jesus laid hands on a few sick people and he healed them. We read in 8.23 to 25 that Jesus laid hands upon a blind man to restore his sight. So there is actually precedent, right, for this action of laying your hands on others. Now in Mark 10, 16, the blessing is the intent rather than the healing. Do you guys see it? But still, the idea that divine power would come from Jesus, whether to heal or to benefit the kids, is an underlying assumption. Now I am about to blow your brain. Can you guys see that the text says that he blessed them? Mark uses a word, Mark wrote in Greek, that is the intensive form of the word bless. 
You guys know what intensive form is? It's like, it's cold, it's icy cold, right? I'm tired, I'm dead tired. So you exaggerate by using an intensive form. Mark uses this intensive form for the word blessing, and it's the only space in the, ach, the only place in the whole New Testament that he uses this word. Now, I try to think in South African English, what would be an intensive form for bless? Here's what I could come up with. Jesus didn't bless them. He blessed them. I see what I did there. Like, hashtag blessed. Bless them abundantly. Fam, the word blessing in Greek means speaking words over someone. That's what it means. And Jesus spoke abundant words over these kids. And he blessed them while speaking these abundant words over them. Once again, it's an exceptional and an important display of the compassion and love of Jesus. Can I ask you again, how confident are you in his love for you. Will you receive a hug from Jesus? Now look, fam, I know that some of you say, I'm not a hugger, and I don't roll with hugs. Fair play. I just want to ask you to let that I don't roll with hugs not keep you from experiencing our Father's beautiful embrace of you. Will you receive his blessing? Because that's what he gives when we encounter him. Last question that I want to ask you is, have you encountered God in this way? Because that's the way into the kingdom. As I was prepping this message, I was listening to some gospel music. And uh, I put on Infinity Play on my music app. So it just keeps going with similar music than the ones that I'm listening to. So that's how I get new gospel music. But sometimes songs would pass and it wouldn't really stop me. And then as I was typing this sermon, a song came up that I've never heard before. The song is called I Am Loved. And it's written by Mac Brock. He was one of the fellows who always led worship for elevation. And as I'm busy typing other English words, these words enter my ear. And as they enter my ear, they just drop into my heart. And I'm like, oh, oh, what a moment. I am receiving you. Look at the lyrics. It's just the first verse. He says, just as I am, you welcome me with open arms. How can this be? My guilt is undone. My past is untethered. I leave it behind and run to my father. There's no disappointment in your eyes. There's no shame. There's only pride. I am loved. Father, I'm loved by you. And as I'm busy typing a sermon, trying to tell you that you're loved by God, this song just ministers to me. And I realize I had to, I had to sit and I had to receive that. I had to drop my resistance to that moment. I had to believe that in my head and in my heart and I had to feel it in my body. Our gracious, beautiful, loving, heavenly Father hugging me. And that's why Jesus died. Do you guys realize that if Jesus didn't die, there's no hugs. If Jesus didn't die, there was only judgment. And we could never pay. But because Jesus died, we have access to the Father. And the kind of access we have now is the King and the Child able to wake him up at three o'clock and ask him, Papa, Papa, will you please give me some water? And that counts for all of us. That's what we put our faith in. That is how we got in. We should never, ever, ever let that moment pass. When God is ready to give to you, you should be ready to receive. And when you receive, you should know that it's all by grace and it's all through faith. You don't have to qualify for it. It's just given to you. How amazing are these four verses? Are you guys with me? Okay, let's land the plane. I want to ask you a few questions. I think there are three responses to this sermon and to the points I've made. So think about the fact that we need and we come and we receive. I think if any of us need, 
or we don't need. What we should ask of God in these moments are, revive the desires of the heart. Revive the desires of my heart. I, I want to need you. But somehow, I don't believe that I do. So it's either, God, I need you, or it is, I want to need you. But please do something in my heart. You guys know that this first step of obedience, I want to, usually starts with, I want to, want to. Are you guys with me? Like, I want to love my wife. But that starts with, I want to, want to love my wife. Do you know what I mean? It's the same with need. We need to need, and we need to want to need. So maybe that's your response this morning, is, Father God, just revive the desires of my heart. Because what I'm desiring has got nothing to do with you. And what I'm desiring has got everything to do with this world. And what I'm desiring is to be so autonomous and so independent that I never need you. And that's sin. And I realize if that's me, I will, I will, I will not enter the kingdom. So please do a work in me. I think that's one response. A second one would be to come, either for the first time, or to come back. And then to come and to get what is given to you. And what is given to you is not a rebuke. What is given to you is not a hiding. What is given to you is a hug and blessing. It's beautiful, isn't it? Think of the prodigal son returning. He was ready to make a speech. The father was ready to bless him. Maybe you just haven't come in a really, a really, really long time. So come back. And maybe that should be your response. And then third one, I just want to ask you a simple question, and that is, do you need a hug? Do you want to be blessed? Because if you do, that's what you'll find with Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are so beautiful and so compassionate and so loving and so awesome that you used such a tender moment embracing kids and blessing them to teach us how to enter your kingdom and how to receive it like a kid thank you that we can be like kids again Thank you that we can be dependent on you. Thank you that we can be confident in your love for us. Thank you that we're allowed to say, Papa, will you please? And Papa, can I please? As many times as we want. Thank you that we can barge into a room, never fearing rejection, but knowing that you love us. Father God, there are so many things that keep us from this experience. Sometimes we need and desire things that have got nothing to do with you. And I pray for my brothers and sisters who might be in that space this morning, that you would revive the desires of their hearts. Sometimes, Father God, for some reason we, we stay away from you. We get busy. We believe that you should be the one chasing after us. We're not intentional about our time with you. We don't ask you for a hug or even for blessing. But we know that when we come back, you'll always receive us. So for those of us who are in that space this morning, Father God, oh, I pray that we would once again experience how amazing your grace is and how beautiful and sweet your love is for us. And then, Father God, I pray that you would hug us, that you would hold us, and that you would bless us abundantly. For all of us who are tired and weary, done with praying the same thing, at wit's end, unsure, uncertain, and discouraged, hold us, hold us, hold us, we pray. 